to Edison Open House Global Healthcare 2021. In this session, we're going to be looking at the work of Volition. It's an epigenetics company developing simple, easy to use tests for early diagnosis of cancer and other diseases. With me is their CEO, Cameron Reynolds. Cameron, welcome. Good morning, Vivian. How are you? Good. Now, you're an epigenetics company, and a lot of people will be thinking, what on earth is epigenetics? <laughs> so let me just start you off with the kind of the, the, dummies, <laughs> the dummies guide to epigenetics, and then you can take us on. Uh, but epigenetics, so uh, if you think of your genome as uh, kind of your body's instruction manual, and you think of it like uh, mm -hmm. a whole collection of recipes, then Epigenetics are the post-it notes that you put on, on a particular page saying, make 10 times more of this one, don't make this one. And those post-it notes are really to are put on in response to environment. So things going on in your life. So that is the dummy's guide. Now take us on to Volition's particular take on epigenetics. Yeah, epigenetic-wise, there's a way I, I prefer to look at it. I'm not a, a scientist uh, myself, so I've learned all this. We have a huge scientific team of volition. We've done an amazing job at revolutionising this area we're working in. The way I, I prefer to look at it is the genetics, I mean, is the, uh, the hardware, like in the computer sense, and the epigenetic is the software. Or as our chief scientist said, uh, the, the genetics is the plans for an entire city, and in our case, the entire cells, our entire uh, being. Um, and the epigenetics decides what's built, where, when, how, and what's destroyed. So the genetics is obviously important. Um, the plans for the city are obviously very important. Um, but the, uh, the epigenetics, which actually means above genetics, is incredibly important as well. And I think it's very fair to say in the last 10, 15 years, there's been a huge amount of emphasis on the genetics since the human genome was mapped you know, a few decades ago. And the epigenetics are extremely important. And uh, we started 10 years ago with our scientific team, who are a world-renowned group. Uh, Dr. McAuliffe worked for the World Health Organization for a few decades, uh, making simple ELISA-based tests. So we've always thought the epigenetics are incredibly important, and I think that's really coming to fruition now. Um, we've managed to spend the last 10 years getting the, the platform incredibly stable, dynamic, robust, that can really read the signals on the nucleosome. The exact chunk we look for um, is, a, is, is nucleosome bound. It's a big word most people haven't heard of and don't understand what it is, but they do understand DNA, and there's 200 base pairs of DNA roughly to every chunk of a nucleosome. And there's a large protein structure there of about um, eight, nine proteins, and uh, it's a very complicated switching mechanism, if you will. And as you're probably aware, in computers, like in humans, the, the hardware and the software, the software is often where you find a lot of the problems. So um, we've We've, we've really been on the same path for the whole existence of the company, showing that these epigenetic changes are very important. They're there, they're very important, and they can be measured very simply and easily and quickly on a very, very robust platform. And that's really where we are now. We haven't absolutely been a company of research and development. Um, we've dominated the space of intellectual property where we are. We have a fantastic platform. Now we do, we're using it in a very wide range of areas because I think we've really cracked something very special. Okay, now if you would link nucleosomes to early detection of cancer for me. That's a very good uh, question, Vivian. So ultimately, um, typically we look for things in the tissue, things like biopsies or looking for detection of disease is usually by actually counterintuitively actually looking at it. Uh, a colonoscopy is looking for the cancer with the human eye, a lung scan, mammographies, all these kind of things are looking at it where most diseases are actually found through blood tests because they're very easy to do, they're routine. And most people have a sense that they go to the doctor for a blood test for cancer, and that really is absolutely not the case. Uh, only in very rare cancers, you actually get detected primarily by uh, blood tests, things like prostate cancer with a PSA. So uh, what we look for are these epigenetic changes, which have been known to be, uh, and because they're the very cause of the cancer, uh, miswiring and switching, if you will, in the epigenetics, um, they're very early there, and because the changes are genome-wide, meaning they're on a wide range of nucleosomes that are altered in the chromatin, uh, you get a very large signal in, in the blood um, from even an early stage cancer. So uh, it's been shown for a long time, these are different in the tissue, that's where you look for the cancer, in the cancer. But as cells die, there's a lot of turnover of cells, um, and you're probably familiar, as are the listeners, that cancer is very dynamic, a lot of births and deaths of cells happening. 
So a lot of these get, and the, the body cuts up the chromatin into nucleosome sized chunks to be reprocessed. So if you have cancer and a lot of other conditions which we can go through, uh, you, you not only have a raised level of uh, overall nucleosomes in circulation, but they have very specific epigenetic changes. And there are hundreds and hundreds of, of structures on the nucleosome, every one of which uh, we've uh, applied for or got is an intellectual property, as well as every method of detection in uh, every living thing. Um, these nucleosomes are not only a factor of cancer, a lot of other diseases, which I can go to later, but also in the animal world. Um, we've launched the very first product is actually in, in dogs, um, where we used, uh, <laughs> we hope we're the, one of the first companies to use human trials for veterinary products, but um, we, we really perfected the platform and shipped the kits to Texas A&M, who are a wonderful group in the vet space, one of the world leaders, and they use the human kits and have worked incredibly well on a range of dog cancers. So um, during the pandemic, it's just much easier to launch, launch products in the animal space than the human for a whole lot of obvious reasons. Um, so that's how it works with early detection. Um, the nucleosomes are there, they're different. We've spent 10 years now um, in a fantastic facility in Belgium, adapting a platform which can really measure them very simply, very quickly, very cheaply. And our ethos has always been to keep it a very low cost routine blood test. So just to be sure I'm getting this, that these tests are specific to a particular cancer. In other words, you don't do a test and says, you know, you've got cancer, but then you have to search for where that cancer is. These uh, epigenetic changes are very specific to particular cancers. And is that also true of the primaries and the metastases? Um, yes and no. So um, there are a lot of changes which we have shown are actually common between a few cancers. So some of our assays you can certainly uh, could be taken as a pan-cancer assay. But that's very tough unless you're very, very specific, because it would just terrify someone to say, you have cancer, we don't know where it is. Of course. Follow-ups, uh, you know, over-diagnosis, they call it, you know, it, and you're going to be wrong. Some of the no, no test is perfect, so you could actually be wrong and put someone through 20 different tests, which, which cover problems. So we're starting in the biggest, uh, most prevalent cancers, and um, we are finding different panels. We work on, on different, different assays on different cancers, um, but there's... You start, the easiest way to start in the assays which work in a range of cancers is to uh, add it to a certain other product, some, some other system currently in, in the system. For example, we're just about uh, working on, on some projects which we'll have data on soon uh, in lung cancer. And the primary screening device at the moment is low dose tomography. So um, the problem with that, it's very sensitive. It picks up the cancers, but it's not very specific. There's a lot of other things it picks up. So we're looking to add our assay to the lung, uh, and if it's if those, two, if you have a lump in your lungs and uh, and and our assays are high, it's very very likely it's lung cancer, for example. But um, we we have a lot of work to do. There's huge numbers of epigenetic signals. I think there's an extremely good chance each one does have a different uh, signal. But you're not looking to do all. I mean, theoretically, there are 200 cancers, but the the major ones make up the the, the majority of of cancers shown. So. We're working on some big cancers. Our big project's always been colorectal, which actually is a screening test. Um, we're doing a 510K in the US also for blood cancers. Um, and I think it's what's important to understand is it, it, how does a small company do all these things? It does it because it's exactly the same platform. What we spend a lot of time, effort, and a huge amount of work from our fantastic team is getting the platform really stable and developed. We're the only group who've looked at these chromatin structures in circulation and um, you know, there's a lot of very smart people working on cancer detection and other diseases. And, and, uh, and there, but I think they're all going down the same path, which tends to be very, very complicated and expensive. And you can get good accuracy and very high accuracy with some of the tests if you go really complicated, really expensive, huge amounts of blood, very expensive products. But that's not going to be a routine blood test that the vast majority of humanity can actually take. So um, we're in the process now of uh, just order of magnitude. Um, we're looking to launch, uh, you know, in, in $100, $150 uh, in the human space for the first level of test, which is very affordable. Most of the other things are well truly in the thousands of dollars. And it doesn't sound big, but if you need 10 or 15 mils of blood, that's a lot to take out of a sick old person. So I think we have something very special. The epigenetics is really, really important. Uh, we dominate the space. And now we have a very stable platform that can launch products. So it's, it's all really coming together. Fantastic. Uh, uh, tell me about your veterinary business, because you've got two businesses, uh, essentially human and veterinary. Where are you in the veterinary space at the moment? Let's deal with that one first. Yes, that's an interesting one, Vivian. So obviously, we, we don't have any expertise in the vet space. Um, 
uh, you know, our chief scientist worked for the World Health in Oncology and, and uh, Women's Health and other things. What we're expert at is making ELISAs. So um, we had a connection through our Belgian group to Texas, um, kind of different Texas in Belgium, you wouldn't necessarily think <laughs> necessarily. But anyway, um, so uh, we spoke to Texas A&M's vet school and they obviously, we something our scientists knew already that it, the nucleosomes are preserved uh, through species and even things as varied as yeast. Actually very interesting how, how common it all is and um, the, the vet market is even wor uh, worse than the human market for how it's serviced by, by oncological de detection. And dogs tend to get a lot more cancers than humans um, for a couple of reasons. Um, you're probably aware they're quite inbred. Um, the, the pure breeds are, are very purely bred, for, for in intentionally so. So they, uh, and particularly breeds are very common to get cancers. But also, um, the reason there's about two or three times more dogs diagnosed in the US than humans every year is not just a function of that, it's a function of the life cycles of dogs. Um, cancer tends to be when you're older, when we're 60, 70, 80, 90, but dogs don't live obviously to that age and they can get cancer at five, six, seven years old. So you have a lot more dog life cycles. And uh, you're probably aware we spend a lot on our animals, we care about them a lot. So um, it's a market which can be very profitable. It's not something that you have to, uh, you can charge very, very similar amounts to the human market. And also the regulation, um, the Texas group are incredibly uh, caring of the animals, but it's not something you need a 10,000 human person trial on, which can cost a lot of money to launch a product. So we sent them some kits and they tested in the two most common dog cancers, um, lymphoma and hemangiosarcoma, and the results were spectacular. Um, 87 and 97% AUC with one assay was absolutely off the charts. Um, and then we, we, we learned from the human, so we hadn't actually looked at non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and the other blood cancers in humans, and we did, and we got extremely similar results in the human space. So, you know, during the, the pandemic, sometimes things hit you in there from behind the thing, you've got, you've got to pay attention. Uh, it wasn't our plan, we're on the track of colorectal and lung, but um, a big US trial has been paused uh, during the pandemic uh, for collection for colorectal because we're not giving colonoscopies at the, the rate we were, so they paused collection. So it seemed like a very good way of really showing now the platform developed and really showing what it can do. And uh, we launched late last year um, and uh, through the GI lab at Texas A&M. And uh, it's, a, it's a very high margin product for us. It's a very accurate test for the, for the uh, animals and for the vets. Um, so we started uh, sort of a beta launch in Texas um, because no one's ever launched a blood test like this uh, in, in the US or anywhere in, in the animal space because nothing's ever really worked. So um, we started and we're now in the process of making sure it all works well and doing a, a big launch in the next uh, few months uh, US wide and looking to make it more international. Also, cancers and disease progression in these cancers. Um, so I think it's potentially, there's 77 million dogs in the US. Um, something I didn't really realize is how much Americans take their dogs to the vets. Um, I think it's, it's starting to spread more in the rest of the world, but. I think the figure we found is 83% of American dogs go to the vet at least once a year, which, uh, and they do annual wellness tests, which um, this can be very much added to. So, um, so if there's 77 million dogs, about 2 million a year get these cancers. Um, so if you, if you just get a, and about 22 million are the age, you'd give this test to the dogs to see if they have the cancers. So potentially um, certainly millions of tests per year and our margin's about $45 um, or sorry, what the revenue to us is $45 per test on a very high margin because it's an ELISA so it's a, it's a low cost thing to make. So I, I think it's a very interesting market. I think we can do a lot of good in the vet market and uh, I think there's going to be a lot of good news on that throughout the rest of this year and into next. That's so interesting and I don't think people realise just how much is coming from the animal market now into humans things like orthopedics uh, and now this it's it's very interesting yes so let's go into the human market and where are the uh, you know the wh where are the advances coming in the human market and what's the time frame uh, for that i know that you're a multinational company so perhaps you could take us through that yes uh we're a multinational a small multinational to be fair but we have a small team in Asia, in the US, and of course in Europe, where our main facilities are. And I think to really, our aims are, are very ambitious. I think it's very, very plausible and possible we could really become something which the vast majority of humanity take at the appropriate time. I mean, cancer testing you tend to do later on. Some cancers are different, but, you know, and are in a range of other diseases. The chromatin fragments are, are very, very important. So we have a strategy in Asia, um, and obviously the big important markets are India and China. 
where uh, Dr. Quay, who works uh, in Singapore, has been a lot of work on launching the first products there. Um, also, ASEAN, um, Southeast Asia, people forget, is over 600 million people as well. So that's certainly uh, a big market. Uh, the European strategy, um, we've just hired our first sales uh, person in, in uh, Belgium to help launch the first product, which is the blood cancer product, as well as organised trials. We we're, we're doing some work on natosis, which is related to COVID, which I, I can get to later. And our team in the US have been organising large trials um, in uh, colorectal cancer, which has uh, been paused, as I said, during the pandemic. And oh, sorry, and uh, in, tai in Taiwan, we have two very large studies going as well in colorectal and lung. So I think um, all the development's gone on in one place in Belgium. Uh, if you look at our website, it's a fantastic 20,000 square foot building. We've just bought the one uh, down the road, another 10,000 square feet uh, as an R&D and production hub, so we can produce all the key components in-house. Um, and then we aim, our strategy for, for marketing <clears throat> has always been to launch the first products ourselves, just wait around. To, we, are, we want to be a big licensing company, but it's very tough if you've never had a product, haven't proved to work to get anyone really to give you a good deal. So uh, to prime the pump, 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 if you will, to get things moving, uh, we've launched the first vet products. We're looking to license. We launched the first cancer products in humans. Um, in, in the blood cancer space, we're doing large trials in lung and colorectal. And the aim of it all is to launch some of our own products, provide a solution on a machine. Um, the auto analyzer we use, um, we have a solution, which is uh, high throughput, also plates for our smaller labs and other areas. And we're also working on point of care, which is a, a paw print, in a paw prick in dogs, but a finger prick in humans, um, to provide a kind of a, a point of care test as well. So I think to, to really dominate the whole market, <clears throat> you can't just have one solution or the other. You need to really be, and, and being an analyzer, it's the most common form of tests. You can really be from the very large machines, from the large companies to smaller machines to microtider plates, which can be run in any lab in the world, and also point of care tests. And there's a really good range of those being developed now. And um, because it's, we, we, we can work on the ELISA platform because the marker we're after is very common and, and a, a target which is easy to do on the simplest platform, it means we can launch in a very wide range of areas. And that's exactly what we're doing. For example, in the vet market, we started on the microtider plates. Uh, we're moving now to the <clears throat> auto analyzer machines for higher throughput. They can do up to 500 tests a day. And we'll, we expect to be able to launch the, uh, the first data and, and the process for launching the, the, the point of care, which again is a, like a pregnancy test or a, you know, a, a home test or a doctor's office with a little machine, those kind of things. So we, we have a strategy for different platforms and for all the regions as we develop a very wide range of products. And I, I think when we started 10 years ago, we couldn't have dreamed um, how widely applicable nutrisomes and the epigenics are. Um, as, and and uh, from, from all the cancers, a very wide range of other conditions, and uh, as, as we talk about the vet space. So widely applicable, cheap, which is important, and just tell me the other conditions besides cancer, just briefly. Um, <clears throat> the most obvious one, so it, it's difficult during the pandemic, and uh, obviously there's been a, a lot of deaths uh, from COVID. What actually kills you in COVID is something called netosis, N-E-T-S, is NETS. And uh, it's the body's pr primary defense mechanism to, to a virus. Um, the, the white cells spray out. It looks a bit like a, a jellyfish if you, if you long chains of chromatin with little bits of poison on, which try to attract and kill the virus, which is excellent, unless, of course, you have a cytokine storm, which means there's too much of this produced, which is what causes the lung problems, the heart problems, and the other organs. So uh, we've never been involved in, in, in anything viral uh, related. We're not, we're not detecting COVID itself. But um, what, what makes up the natosis, which kills you, is large chains of chromatin, which is exactly what we measure. So um, we, we thought about it back in February and March and realised there's really no um, way to diagnose if you have natosis, which again is, is what kills you. And um, it turns out there's been a huge amount of work based on natosis. It kills you in sepsis as well, and sepsis is actually the biggest killer in hospitals. Um, and things as widely as, as also like diabetes and, and a range of other things. So uh, we, we, we engaged, worked with quite a few clinicians and it showed we, we can really have a very, very high signal in people with bad netosis through COVID. So now we're working on a range of other conditions to show um, that if it works in those and if it does, we can launch a product, I think, this year on netosis. And I think that could be incredibly good uh, use for what we do. Um, there's 
uh, if you want to try to treat natosis, which is what causes death in COVID and all those other things, you really need to be able to detect that you have that problem in the first place. Um, obviously, you're not going to give someone a treatment for natosis if primarily because natosis is your body's primary defense mechanism. So if someone's sick, you want to make sure they have an excess of it before you start clearing them out for, for obvious reasons. So um, that's something which we do a lot of work on. I think could be as big as the vet space and the cancer space because um, it's a really cutting edge field and uh, we really put ourselves in a great position because um, it's exactly what we detect from, from the cancer side. It's a different, uh, different mechanism in the process, but it's, a, it's an incredibly similar mechanism to what we've been detecting already. So it's again, something we can do very quickly, easy and cheaply um, during the pandemic. Um, so it's very exciting. I, I think it's just remarkable, the breadth of the, the epigenetic platform that we've developed. I mean, this is fantastically exciting science. It's, 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 it's wonderful. Uh, let me just go to the investment side. What are the milestones that investors should be looking out for over the next six to 12 months? Well, obviously now we are shifting to the product side after a, a, a time developing the platform and that's typical of diagnostic companies. I think it's a mistake to launch too quickly when you're really not ready and then you get judged on a product that's really not up to the job. So throughout the year, um, just on the research and development side, then I'll get to the product side. Um, we have a lot of data coming out on the Natosa side through things like COVID and a bit of sepsis and some of the therapies. Um, we have some data points coming up quite quickly on the lung cancers uh, from Taiwan, um, which so that's something which will and should have a steady stream of uh, lung data. Um, also, the cold rectal side, we'll be doing bits and pieces more, but that's tougher during the pandemic. Um, we've started the trial now, uh, so and switching to the products. Uh, we hope to be able to launch a product soon for Natosis. Um, the vet side will be reporting how the sales are going and how we're going to be picking that up through different places, different countries, uh, more labs running our tests, and we're very excited about all that. We'd also expect to have some licensing deals through this year. Um, we're talking to groups in, in Asia about licensing, also the vet space and also in Europe. And that's the kind of the second stage, launch our own products and start aggressively licensing. So that should be, uh, should be very good. Um, and uh, we're just launching our new production facility to, to make the key components so that we can license, not just go to a company and say, do you want our IP, but give them the key components to make it for whatever they're doing. So I think there'll be a lot of data, a lot of product news and a lot of new product news throughout the year. And I think it's going to be a really, really good year for us. And how about your cash runway and your funding? Yeah, so we had about, about $21 million in the bank uh, last quarter. Um, and uh, we've been burning uh, 1.5, 1.7, up to 2 million, depending on the month. So say 1.7 million. But um, we have uh, been doing two things to keep the runway uh, quite extensive. Um, we've just announced another batch of non-dilutive funding from the Walloon region. Um, which I think takes it about 13, 14 million dollars uh, from them so far. And um, we've been uh, raising bits of small bits of money through ATM throughout the year to also extend our runway. Um, so I think we're in a good position um, to really deliver these milestones this year. Fantastically exciting, uh, as you say. Uh, I mean, 2020 has been difficult for everybody. I'm getting the impression that 2021 for you is looking rosy. Yes, I, I couldn't be happier and prouder of the team. I think that the, the one way of dealing with the pandemic would have been it's all a bit too hard. You know, it's, it's everyone's at work from home and we all know how difficult that can be sometimes. That's where I am now. Um, it, it can be very difficult. And uh, the team has shown amazing resilience and, and pride in, in the work we're doing and commitment to really delivering something very special. And uh, it's, it's, it takes a lot of work to, to develop a platform when you don't have products and you're developing something really cutting edge that no one else has been working on uh, and now to show how well it works in a range of areas. Um, I think it's going to be absolutely when we start to really reap the rewards of fantastic work from a fantastic team of people who could really change the world of, of medicine and, uh, and science by doing this platform and, and help a lot of people. So I think 21 is the start of some fantastic products. So it should be really exciting. Cameron Reynolds, it's been such a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Vivian, and thank you, everyone.